Here's a peek at what guests had to say after the show. Okay, we're back. Larry Miller, question for you. Who's a guest you'd like to have on your podcast in the future? I don't have guests, but if I did have guests... Always nice to meet a fan, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have guests. That's right. I've listened to your podcast. That's amazing, the verbal drive, to be able to just talk like that. You must think very highly of yourself, Larry. Nice for <laughs> uh, Barney Frank, do you feel more liberated being out of Congress? Oh, you must. Oh, absolutely. I... I don't have to worry that when the phone rings, it's somebody who's screwed something up and says right. it's my responsibility to unscrew it. You know, you were in a fairly safe district. You were not one of those Congress people who have to worry about every little thing. You could come on this show and sit next to a pot-smoking atheist, and it wouldn't bother you. With oh, I... Which pot-smoking atheist were you talking about? Here? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, oh, you are liberated. Woo. No, I, I regret I had asked my governor to appoint me to a... Yes, like in Senate seat. I he wish decided they had. not to. And I was looking forward to having my husband, Jim, hold the Constitution, not the Bible, and affirm, not swear, that I was going to be right. a wonderful senator. You would have been a wonderful senator. And <laughs> Man, if you, you and Elizabeth Warren both there, that would have been quite a team. Well, we can only dream. Uh, Josh, will scandals such as Wieners be more common in politics now because of the way we use the Internet? Oh, absolutely. There's no gay man under 35 with a smartphone who doesn't have pictures floating out there that he would worry about showing up on Gawker if he uh, really? ran for mayor of New York. Why do you say gay man? It's more... Well, it's a lot of straight people, too, but I think it's, you know, it's, e it's, even, it's even more... Uh, prevalent? Even more prevalent. Right. Well, can I just note that I'm 73 and I have a flip phone? Okay, so, so but Barney can still be mayor of New York. Larry's 58, he has a rotary phone. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Larry once, you, you with purposely plugs. got a rotary phone after they were long gone because it made you feel I start every call by saying, Watson, come in here, I need you. <laughs> okay, which is more concerning, government tracking your online information or corporations doing the same thing? That's a good question, I would say government by a hair a little they have you know they have guns, guns and tanks and drones. And drones. Well, yeah say, right the potential is worse for government but the day-to-day -day abuses so far have been on the corporate side. I think yeah. people worry too much about what corporations are doing with their data because I think most of the data about you is actually not very interesting. I mean, when Gmail came out, people were freaked out that they were going to look through your emails and right. have an algorithm sent, show you mm. ads that were relevant based on that. That seems marginally useful to me. I mean, I still, still don't click on the ads, but it's not like this computer is sifting through my emails and then calling my Josh, mother and I agree with her, that, but on yeah. some of the financial information, <laughs> yeah. this business about people being denied bank accounts, sure. it has to do with the, with there the are financial information yeah. is being very misused. Uh, yeah. They used to be able to raise your interest rate on money you already owe the credit card company if somebody else reported you owed something. We outlawed that, but in the financial area, there have been a pattern of abuses. All right, Barney, what do you think of Elizabeth Warren's and John McCain's proposal to reinstate Glass-Steagall? Well, that's a big one. I don't think it gets at our problems. For example, the bad loans that were made, the mortgage loans, Glass-Steagall didn't affect those. Um, Many of them were made by non-banks. The biggest problem was, as opposed to 40 years ago, when Glass-Steagall was in effect, they changed and people made loans and then sold the loan called Securitized. So I didn't care whether the person was going to pay back or not. The whole derivatives issue. Um, Glass-Steagall, the big mistake was in 2000 when Congress voted, I didn't, to totally deregulate derivatives. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was the most serious problem. And that's the key issue now, is to get the derivatives regulated. But, but when Glass-Steagall went away, was it 99? It was yes. under Clinton, right? Yep. I mean, isn't that really when they let the dogs out? No, when, I... When the well, banks just took your money to the I dog I voted track. against that, but securitization, for example, which is really, I think, the single worst problem. Forty years ago, you borrowed money from a person you had to pay back, and if you're going to have to pay me back, I'm going to frisk you pretty good. And then they came up with securitization in the 80s, where all these loans were made by people who didn't care whether you paid it. In fact, they, they, they sold that loan. Then these ridiculous rating agencies told people it was worth something when it wasn't. Is this what Dodd-Frank got rid of? Yes, we got rid of the, uh, there's now what we call risk retention. If you are gonna sell a package of loans, you, and they gotta put this rule out soon, you take the first 5% of the losses uh, so that you no longer can, can do this lending for free. Plus we banned the worst kind of the loans because there was no more incentive for the borrower, for the lender not to make them. Uh, so those two things we did. And the other thing was, 
um, well, it was the three. People made bad loans, then other people sold them, and then other people insured them. Right. Credit defaults. Bet against their and own. We, we yeah. have cracked down on that substantially as well. Do you think the teabaggers know when they. <laughs> well, when, when John Boehner says, you know, I hate regulations, do they know that regulation is a, is a word that means I'm making rules so you don't get robbed? I, I don't think they do. I'm sorry, you were going to say? I was just going to say that I, I agree that securitization was a problem, but securitization was sort of financially engineered out of investment banks, and Glass-Steagall's about separating investment banks from commercial banks. They were both making those bad loans. So separating them, that one was making the bad loans, the other was selling the but bad loans. I think a lot of this misses the big issue. I mean, I was a banker during this period in 2006, 2007, so I was part of your problem. Well, but now um, it comes out. <laughs> But, well, actually, I, I really wasn't part of the problem at Kincaid because I was at Wells Fargo, which is a company that had a, a relatively healthy attitude toward credit and was, you know... And it, holds on to its loans. Yeah. Sure. The banks that were doing the securitization, they still failed because you, you have this pipeline and you haven't sold everything off yet. So the people who are, like, supposed to have been saying, well, I don't care because I don't have any of the risk, those people lost all their and money. And that was Citigroup and Merrill Lynch. It I, happened to I, both of them. I, th I think the problem is just people got crazy about the idea that real estate could only get more valuable. Gosh. And so it was safe to lend as much money They're as you wanted They're doing it again, by the way. I agree, yeah, by the way. And, and the doing it to again. that is you, is you need to make people have equity. You need to make homeowners have equity, and you need to make banks have equity. Josh, there's one, yeah. one difference to have with you. Yes, yeah. they did wind up losing their money. The problem was they didn't think they would. Right, they, exactly. They, because they, it turns out selling the loans and not having to worry about repayment wasn't as foolproof as they thought. Right. But it, it, it emboldened them to go and, and, and do the wrong thing. The other thing we did, by the way, is just to ban those kind of loans. You can't make loans anymore to people who can't possibly pay them back. Except the Obama administration wants a weakening of lending standards because they want more people buying houses. I'd, yeah, so do the bankers. I agree. Yeah. But it's in the statute. There's only a certain amount they can go to okay. the statute. It's pretty tough. Last right? question, Alex, as you get it. Do you feel that the word protest has become negative in the U.S. as opposed to Europe, where protests are seen in a more positive light? I certainly think Europe has stronger protest culture than the United States, but I think the Texas State Legislature, I think Moral Mondays in North Carolina, what's happening with the Dream Defenders in the state capitol in Tallahassee, I think protest has a really good connotation right now in this country. My problem is that they don't do it in the right way. Sitting in Rick Scott's office isn't going to hurt him at all. I am for toughness on the part of the advocates, but that means going into these people's districts, organizing and going after them. Having marches and protests in general, unfortunately, I wish it had more of an impact, doesn't, in fact, let me put it this way, if you are a politician and the people who your voters are opposed to come and demonstrate, you want to get film of it so you can use it in your next commercial. Well, then why did you go down to the Freedom Summer and go to Mississippi and leave Harvard? Because people in Mississippi couldn't vote. You've obviously been waiting to try and catch me, but you're wrong on this one. <laughs> Here's the deal. Why not stay in Harvard? Let me respond. I was hoping you'd say that. Civil you disobedience and demonstrations <laughs> done by Gandhi and Martin Luther King were on behalf of people who couldn't vote. I went to Mississippi in the summer of 64 because the Mississippi black people weren't allowed to vote. And once we were able to get the Voting Rights Act, it was to physically protect them. We went to Mississippi because black people got beaten up. And when white people from the north came down, they were a little more nervous about that. But what then happened was through political pressure, you got the Voting Rights Act. And since the Voting Rights Act came, Blacks in Mississippi don't send for white helpers anymore. They vote. They go through the political process. There's now a black congressman from Jackson and black mayors. So that's precisely the point. If you don't have the vote, if you have no other option, then you have to use direct action. But where you have the ability to vote and pressure your legislators, that's why the Tea Party is, unfortunately, from my standpoint, so much more effective than Occupy. I wish it was the other way around. But what Martin Luther King was doing at the time that he was assassinated is he was moving into the Poor People's Party and he was trying to organize on economic Unions, issues. Yes. And you were talking about money out of politics. And now we know that people at the lowest echelons of income have zero influence over no, the that's politics. No, that's, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy that I wish you would stop doing. Tell people that they have no influence and they won't vote. Right. I wish there were voter registration tables that occupy. The voted people will it's listen to the not voters. What the movement was about. Right. That's right. It wasn't what the movement was about. The movement was about feeling good emotionally and not participating in effective well, ways for political change. I think you should talk to the Green Party right. then. The Green Party is about registration. Finish this up in oh, the green that. room. <laughs> it's the summer. I'm gone fishing. Thank you very much, everybody. Real time with Bill Maher, Friday night at 10. Ask Bill and his guests your questions right after the show at HBO.com.